I'm excited to share with you some information about uh, some specific developments in the field of uh, deep learning and how some old ideas are um, uh, being used to try to overcome one of the biggest challenges uh, in the deep learning community right now. So to give us a, a broader picture and a good basis for the motivation, I will start with a very brief um, history lesson in the uh, neural networks. And um, I will focus uh, um, on the uh, categorization of, of uh, neural uh, computational cells in the neural network model. So if we go back and think uh, about why the original neural artificial neural network models were developed, it was, of course, to simulate the neurons in the brain. So we all know about the McCullough and Pitts neuron and then the development from Rosenblatt um, making the what's now known as the perceptron model, usually thought in the introductory courses at the university for the uh, neural networks. Um, these, uh, these are what can be considered the first generation or the uh, neurons based on threshold gates. Then we have the development of the second generation with the introduction of the activation functions. And this is basically what we still use today. These are the basis of all the modern feed forward and recurrent neural networks. And their main advantage or their uh, main contribution at the time was that uh, they uh, now possess the ability to uh, work with uh, uh, continuous uh, input and uh, output, which uh, makes, them, makes the networks differentiable. And then uh, another major uh, factor is the introduction of the Verbos's uh, backpropagation algorithm. And uh, from the technical point of view, also uh, the combination with the automatic differentiation framework, which are allowed for a very practical or easy to use training of the multi-layer neural networks. OK, so um, now looking at the recent explosion of the uh, uh, interest in the deep learning community, and um, we can uh, acknowledge the fact that about 2010, the scientists realized, OK, uh, we have these uh, affordable GPUs, and they are kind of uh, could be exploited to, to scale up this backpropagation algorithm. And this is basically what has been driving uh, the whole progress. And um, yeah, exactly. The, the simply the, adding the another component to having a good model, good training algorithm, and now sufficiently good, good hardware. However, uh, if one looks more closely at these very um, yeah, milestones and landmark uh, papers and developments in deep learning, like these huge models, we usually uh, observe that, that they have been developed by uh, large companies with vast amounts of resources. So uh, why is that so? Um, uh, the reason is that despite um, these components coming together of uh, model algorithm and hardware and allowing for for cool results to be produced, these are still very suboptimal for uh, scaling up to the demands of the deep learning. And uh, one can uh, easily observe that the exponential increase in the data availability has not been followed by the performance of the CPUs, GPUs, or, or the TPUs. And the way um, people have overcome this is simply with vast uh, amounts of money by uh, having this infrastructure available to, to drive these new uh, milestones. Um, and then th this has led to, led to the uh, problems, of course, and uh, acknowledgement of these enormous costs of energy to, to develop and train these types of models. And then you get these headlines like, is the deep learning new oil industry having um, uh, enormous impact uh, also on the environment simply by uh, using too much energy? So um, now we, we wonder why uh, uh, what is the what is the actual problem here? Why what is the underlying uh, uh, issue with uh, with these methods that make them uh, not really scalable to uh, demands that we have today on this field? And this leads us back to the original uh, von Neumann architecture, or uh, more specifically, the decoupling of the processing and the memory uh, in the computers. And these, this architecture is also used even in, in more optimized uh, hardware like GPUs and TPUs that are made to, to handle these um, vectorized or ma matrix operations. However, they still obviously lack 
uh, or suffer from the bad scalability, then this implies also the issues with latency and, of course, the energy usage. There has been then uh, many developments in the uh, deep learning community to kind of work around these issues. And these have involved, if one looks from, from a, a slightly different perspective, also uh, implementing um, all kinds of uh, brain-like properties. So uh, things that we already find in biological uh, neural networks, uh, concepts like sparsity, everything from model sparsity and weights, all the way to uh, ephemeral sparsity, if you will, things like sparse activations and even conditional computations where only part of the network is maybe executed depending on the output of some previous block of the network. Um, most importantly, the development of uh, distributed learning uh, algorithms or, or um, heuristics to, to use backpropagation in a, a distributed way has been crucial to scaling up uh, these issues. However, the fundamental things have not changed. The models have stayed uh, largely the same, the second generation based on the uh, nonlinear activation functions. Uh, the hardware is based on von Neumann architecture and the uh, training algorithm has also, been, uh, has also remained the same. Um, so now um, this, this serves as a good motivation uh, for asking the, the question, how can we uh, do this differently? Can we do something completely different and, and get better at it? And um, the one pot potential answer lies in looking back at the original inspiration. So in the neuroscience or more specifically in the biological brains. So brain is still the only instance we know of the uh, general in uh, intelligence. And it also is able to handle most uh, of the interesting tasks better than the artificial uh, 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 intelligence. Uh, and more importantly, does that with very low latency and uh, maybe to, in today's world, uh, most importantly, with very low energy usage. So um, this um, gives uh, the inspiration for um, uh, what has been described as the third generation of these neural networks or the computational units in the neural networks called spiking neural networks. These have been developed for a very long time how they just haven't gained any popularity due to their lack of uh, computational power or or uh, lack ability to train them to achieve uh, any interesting results however uh, fundamentally they try to uh, um, they try to uh, emulate or, or or model some of these most uh, important functional properties of real neurons and this fundamentally ta tackles the problems that we previously discussed that, uh, of the deep learning field or the artificial neural networks today. Um, so how do they do it and what is the model actually and what does it imply? So as opposed to the artificial neural networks and the real biological neural networks, these spiky neural networks are somewhere in between of course, much more co closer to the artificial neural networks. So all of you familiar with um, simple recurrent uh, uh, neural networks or recurrent cells should be uh, uh, very familiar uh, with uh, with the concepts at play here. I will describe a few technical details for uh, anyone interested. So think of a simple recurrent cell with the uh, a cell state, something like GRU or LSTM that has state. Um, it sums up the uh, weighted sum of the inputs as, as any cell and adds it to the cell state. However, the cell state is then uh, uh, leaky. It's a leaky integrator, so it decays its value over time. What's very interesting here is the activation function is no longer a nonlinear function, but a threshold function, same as in the first generation that I previously mentioned. However, the crucial part is here when the threshold is crossed and the network produces uh, the output, which is in, in this case a binary output, so it produces a one at the output. At the same time, the cell state is reset. This implies that the um, output of the, this type of neuron is very sparse. And on the bottom right, you can see a plot of a simulation of that type of network solving a simple task where the uh, outputs of these neurons are extremely sparse in time and in space. Um, so uh, what does this mean? Well, um, first, this, these type of networks allow um, the 
first of all, they don't demand these uh, matrix multiplications with, with uh, floating point values. And also they don't uh, require uh, um, kind of uh, um, aligned computation or, or a, a clock, if you will, which means uh, there's no need for synchrony and it's much easier to, uh, uh, to develop a distributed and parallel architecture for these where crucial part is again, the co-location of memory and processing, which uh, unlocks further uh, features of neural computation, such as following. So uh, very fine grained parallelism, which allows for enormous scaling. Um, then the event-driven computation, which is crucial for saving energy. And then there are additional um, interesting concepts that come to play like stochasticity, um, um, which kind of plays a role in the robustness. And then the most uh, um, kind of the holy grail of this, uh, all of this is the ad online adaptation or uh, learning in, in the real time. Um, now, this, all of this is not just theoretical work. There has been a, a lot of developments in the hardware community also developing, developing what's called the neuromorphic uh, uh, hardware or ne neuromorphic chips. And here are just a couple of examples, uh, very prominent ones like Intel Loihi that um, developed in US and of course the Spinnaker platforms one and two developed in UK and Germany. These are based on many small ARM um, core processors that are kind of uh, architectured in specialized way. And there's even uh, kind of analog digital uh, mix uh, chips like brain scales and others. Now the exciting part, um, Okay, this sounds very promising, but why isn't anyone hearing about this? Well, the the process, the the progress has really exploded in the last uh, two or three years, and uh, this is only re recently be, ha has been hitting the mainstream uh, community. Meaning, there's has been a lot more papers available on on neurips or published in the neurips that deal with spiky neural networks and so on. And here is a small overview of highlights achieved, for example, by Intel uh, Loihi chip uh, group, uh, where uh, they demonstrate um, that on many uh, different tasks and use cases, everything from keyword spotting, image classification, uh, embedding for similarity, search, gesture recognition, basically um, all, all the interesting tasks, even uh, que question answering, uh, th that are being used in deep learning community now on in this specific uh, uh, hardware model and algorithms. And we can see on the right side, kind of the uh, on the X axis, the ratio of the reference platform versus the neuromorphic solution and on Y axis, uh, uh, latency uh, ratio between the neuromorphic and, and the reference architecture and the reference architectures inc include everything uh, CPUs, GPUs, and even the specialized uh, uh, neural compute uh, platforms from Intel. And everything above this diagonal line shows um, uh, better performance uh, in, term, uh, in terms of energy and uh, latency on the neuromorphic platforms. And what we can already see is that there are uh, um, many use cases where we have in, um, orders of magnitude better energy efficiency and latency uh, for solving these tasks. Uh, yeah, so th there's up to two orders of magnitude, so 100 times better energy efficiency and even more for latency. Um, the same can be said also for the Spinnaker uh, group here in Germany. There has been a lot of developments uh, mostly focused in the direction of uh, um, automotive industry and uh, um, industry 4.0, 4 so IoT ex um, applications. And um, I, now I will try to give you maybe a more exciting or, or interesting uh, concrete uh, cases and demonstrations of these technologies, uh, showing how these can unlock uh, very no, even a novel use cases, not just replicating what has been done in the deep, lear deep learning community so far. Um, no. The part of this demonstration would be using also uh, an interesting uh, uh, sensor. In this case, it's a event-based camera, which is uh, another it brings another uh, kind of a feature or multiplier to these benefits because combining these uh, event-based or uh, neuromorphic uh, sensors, if you will, with the uh, neuromorphic hardware, uh, spiking models, and specialized algorithms 
gives a, a very uh, new approach to solving many problems. And in this case, this is just uh, demonstrating that um, as opposed to frame-based sensors, uh, this type of event-based sensor does not have a synchronized frames, but has a stream of events in time and is very sparse, meaning it detects only the changes in the image and not, um, not the whole picture in a, a regular intervals, which uh, makes it uh, uh, very robust to things like motion blur or even the dynamic range. So here is a, a, a very uh, short uh, um, video uh, showing the, on the top left how the regular camera suffers from the motion blur and uh, and uh, difficulty in the dynamic range uh, adaptation, uh, which makes it unusable in very fast moving situations to, to perform uh, accurate localization. And on the bottom left, we see a, a, a scientist uh, rotating the camera. On the top right, however, we see the output of this specialized camera and how it can be uh, used because it, it, it has a super fast uh, this event stream that allows for identifications of, of different uh, uh, features in the room and uh, kind of uh, real-time precise localization. And uh, this has happened in 2017 and just scaling this up shows us uh, how uh, the drones can be uh, uh, localized and uh, stabilized even in the most extreme casing, cases using the camera in very dark situation and spinning uh, very in a very fast manner where uh, using a regular camera is impossible and the drone would just crash, which is what we see on the left. And on the right, we see how the drone stays stable and is uh, usable even in this extreme uh, situation so from this what can uh, kind of infer uh, all kinds of use cases from autonomous driving so having a uh, better uh, vision in all kinds of uh, lighting situations to having a much faster latencies for reaction times maybe even more important for the uh, for example factories and industry and iot uh, field so this has been a, 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 just a single interesting use case. There are many, as I've previously mentioned. And just to kind of uh, uh, summarize, um, there are still uh, standing challenges in the deep learning. A lot of things have been just worked around by having more resources. This new generation of uh, uh, spiking neural networks in combination with specialized hardware and algorithms, which overcame their original problems of not performing great have allowed for this new trend and development of uh, highly efficient AI solutions um, that, uh, that are uh, not only uh, performing the uh, standard machine learning uh, tasks uh, orders of magnitude more efficiently, but also unlocking new and interesting uh, use cases with uh, a combination uh, with these unique um, uh, sensors. So um, thanks uh, everyone for listening. I hope this uh, has inspired you uh, to, to maybe look into this field more closely or uh, maybe uh, also you have some good questions uh, regarding this topic. Thank you. Thank you, Dajan. It was really nice and insightful presentation. Uh, since I am also from data science background and currently I'm pursuing my master's in the same, I found it really interesting. So it was a couple Great. of days ago that I was discussing with my friend about these spiking neural networks and how are they different from the original neural networks that we use. So yes, right now I don't see any questions in the question window, but I do have a question of my own. <laughs> <laughs> so Great. what I would like to know is that, uh, is this concept really in the development phase or are companies already using it? What is the progress with this technology in practical implementation? It depends on the use case. Uh, it is mostly in the development phase. So the Intel group and Germany group, they are all, all heavily um, in, the, in the development phase for uh, many new uh, use cases. However, regarding things like uh, vision tasks and so on there has there are already kind of commercial applications and smaller companies um, 
already selling commercial solutions. However, this is uh, not very widespread or mainstream uh, yet. So, um, but in terms of these really major breakthroughs where the, these things would be deployed on, on a larger scale, um, it's still in the development and the uh, one can yeah, basically see it also as a, the spike is, has only just started in the uh, publishing venue. So, um, yeah. But the uh, exciting part is that the, uh, there's a lot of in, in, interest from the industry, uh, like basically Intel developing one of these platforms. And then uh, also the Spinnaker group getting a lot of uh, grants and, and uh, support from the industry to, to work toward uh, uh, solutions in a very short term. Okay, okay yeah. great, great, great. So yeah, another thing was that you focused on your presentation about its application in the field of how it can be used for like say drone stabilization and in general yeah this image is just one kind fun of... yeah yeah okay so one what fun use just, case oh, yeah <laughs> what are yeah. the other respective applications if you can just briefly tell us about some of them yeah so maybe a, a more general uh, explanation for this would be uh the main benefits of this would would be to have something like uh real-time continuously running uh, a model for something specific and um, things like uh, yeah processing in real time mostly with a, in temporal domain most of all so things like um, speech processing or even video processing something with uh, with uh, temporal domain so i think it would uh, kind of uh, bring the most benefits uh, to such use cases where you have uh, time-based task and on the other hand something that needs to be kind of uh respond quickly or or, or in the in the real time so think of uh, edge ai mo most of those use cases as opposed to having some big batch processing in the cloud or somewhere where you can wait a long time for the response um, this is uh, not uh, probably not the appropriate uh, usage of this uh, kind of methods so uh, to be more specific, keyword spotting or, or uh, yeah, speech recognition, that would be one very good uh, use case for this that's already vi widely available. And if it could uh, uh, kind of uh, reach the, the accuracy of the current solution in, the, let's say, um, assi uh, audio or speech assistance, then, then this would make a lot of sense because you can run the whole model on the edge. OK, great, great, great. I see a couple of questions in the question answer area. So one question is, many computers have built-in GPUs. What do you think about the benefits and drawbacks of developing AI software, which needs to be downloaded slash installed on each user's PC and move away from cloud computing? Oh uh, yeah, uh, okay. That, that's uh, yeah, n not so specific to to this technology, but uh, very related. Still, I think the main question is uh, yeah, edge AI versus cloud AI uh, benefits or or drawbacks. The most obvious one is is of course the the issue of privacy. Um, edge AI basically could guarantee us the privacy for for running uh, many things. Also. Uh, usually lower latency drawback is of course you're going to use more of the battery on your device or, or on your phone to run these models so it's a big trade-off uh, again the for very uh, highly optimized solutions that kind of work perfectly on these uh, embedded uh, accelerators uh, and, and gpus on the phones things like image recognition i think this is kind of the optimal use case uh, for other uh, things, it's mostly not. Um, so yeah, but my answer is definitely a huge advantage. Privacy uh, drawback would be uh, energy usage on your device. <laughs> so, but these models can be used on like my personal PC and they don't need a great cluster or so for the usage. For Specifically for the spiking networks, uh, if you want to have these a hundred times more efficient energy and latency you need a specialized hardware so not the cpu not the gpu but either this 
uh, specialized things with ARM chips like uh, developed by Spinnaker or something like Loihi chip. The, techno the technology there in, in Loihi is completely different. It's based on the switching technology, so the network switches. So you can uh, kind of have packets as communication be between neurons. So it's a very different thing. And uh, I don't think would uh, we would, uh, yeah, uh, have any benefits of using the spiking networks on the current hardware. So this, this is a crucial point. You really need a specialized hardware to see the benefits. Okay, okay, I guess that answers the query. So another question we have is, what's the mechanism for learning in some of these new models? Yeah, good question. So this has been the largest uh, difficulty in, in getting to the exciting new results with these models. So the, the algorithms were lacking. So historically, there was no algorithm that can you know train a spiking neural network to do uh, speech recognition they were ju just too weak and, and and not amenable to this and uh, some recent developments from a uh, past like uh, three and four years um, have overcome this and now we are can say we're on par with the artificial ne networks on some tasks what are the algorithms there are a few categories if you will one uh, very big category that has a lot of papers published is simply um, type of, let's say, transfer learning. So people train um, artificial network that does really well one task and then transfer that and convert it in some way to a spiking model that performs just as well or as almost as well. Uh, so this is uh, one approach that that's totally not you know biological or interesting for the <laughs> for the scaling up because you're again bound to the artificial networks then there are um things like uh adapting the the, the models and back propagation through time to basically work directly as you would expect it in tensorflow uh this is what i've been doing and this has provided a uh, great success for uh, yeah getting to great results however uh, it is expensive to run because you're still sim simulating this on the GPUs, let's say, which is not very uh, compatible and you, you're limited by, let's say, the model size and things like that. You, you require a lot of memory. And the most exciting uh, category of these uh, algorithms would be then um, the actual kind of neuromorphic style uh, maybe adaptation of the or reformulations of the backprop kind of trying to emulate backprop in a very different sparse or event-based asynchronous way on these specialized hardwares. Um, these are kind of uh, usually described as biological or biologically plausible learning rules. And these are uh, the most promising for the scaling and for the future. However, uh, yeah, depending on does they are still not performing at the level of backpropagation. So this is uh, maybe the most uh, exciting or the most important development in the field now. 